tourism is one of the Taiwan's key initiatives in enhancing its competitiveness and integration with the global community. Today, we will explore how the nation is working toward to meet that goal by 2030. Hi, and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Catherine Liu. I'm Rath Wang. We're excited to have Maria Brom here with us today for an exclusive interview. Marie is widely known in Taiwan as the mother of English language learning after founding Studio Classroom in 1962 and teaching English in Taiwan for over seven decades. I will also be speaking to Ralph Rogers, Taiwan Director of the British Council on what it takes for the country to get to bilingualism. The British Council is the UK's government's international arm in promoting cultural and educational cooperation in over 100 countries. You've been here for over seven decades. You've even mentioned that home is where the heart is, and your heart is here in Taiwan. So Taiwan is your home. Can you talk a bit about what specifically keeps you here in Taiwan for so long and you continue to make Taiwan your home? Okay, you know, a lot of people ask me, when you came here, did you expect to stay so long? And I said, I don't even know I'm going to live this long. <laughs> because, you know, the Queen of England, she was 96. She said, well, 96. But anyway, uh, what keeps me here is the fact that there's still a need for learning. And I came here to help. And they still can use some help. So I can help myself, but I can encourage others. I can teach the teachers. And so I still think I can be used to be useful. And so I like to make a difference in the lives. And the people here have been very kind and very generous. And I love Taiwan. And my heart is here. So this is my home. If you could talk a bit about the people that, you know, you've touched and, and um, you know, what reaction you've had from them. And so many people have told me that because of the English, their whole life has changed. Some people have been become businessmen, inventors. And some people said without English, they could not do what they did today. So I feel like making a difference is very important. Mm -hmm. And if we do something that makes a difference in people's lives, then we'll never regret it. Well, boy, ho, ho, we won't do that. So I'm so happy that I can still be useful here. That's why I'm still here. Uh, you've established a whole system, educational system, very early on, and it's, it's been going on for more than seven decades. Um, me, personally, I, I'm one of your readers, and I, I, I think it's extremely helpful. Can you share with us why mo and what motivate you in the first place to establish such educational system in enhancing Taiwan's English level in general? Well, there's many ways to help people, but language is also very important. Uh, when you go to some other country, you have to learn their language. You know, when I go to Hualien, to the tribes people, I speak their language. I have to speak to them in their language, see? And you go to Japan, you know, when you go someplace, learn a little of their language, and then they can relate to you better. But I think that English is not just a something to say it's a tool but english and music and all go together and when you learn music you can repeat the words a lot instead of just say bay, 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 bay. you can sing the words and so i think i love music more than english but english and music can go together yes. and that way you can remember better if you sing it or it is interesting how you talked about music. We like to talk about the journey of love. It's a touching musical uh, released last year on your very own personal story. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay, I didn't know they want to make this kind of a thing about me because of you know, I feel kind of embarrassed. But the thing I like about it is the fact that as you see all these years that what you've done has helped people a little bit. You know, some people, they want to make a lot of money and they think, oh, I've been, and my, my goal is not to do that. My goal is to help people. And I see through this that this shows that I have helped people. And so this is very satisfying to me to see that I have been able to help people. Uh, why musical, the story? Well, uh, the musical, I think, just gives people a chance to see what you can do if everybody does their little part. And you know, one person cannot do anything. You have to have others helping you. You, you, you cannot say, I did this, I did, no, we did this. And so I believe 
in working together as a group. And I think you can see that in the musical, how as a group we can do something, not one person. It's fascinating how you mentioned working together to make something happen and you know yes. making a difference in people's lives. And we've actually summarized in a short video your 70 year um, career here and the great work that you've done and the people that you've touched. Our reporter attending has more. Let's take a look. Meet the champion who transformed Taiwan's English education. For over half a century, Doris Brome has taught English throughout the island nation, from the capital Taipei to the most remote mountain villages. And she's also a talented musician. Doris originally came to Taiwan from the United States as a missionary. But today, she's probably best known for producing English learning materials like magazines. I'm here on the streets of Taipei to find out what Taiwanese think of the magazine and how they have learned English. I think there are lots of junior high school and senior high school students are using this magazine to learn English, yeah, and it's their first step to step into this English world. Studio Classroom is among the most popular English learning magazines in Taiwan. The magazine and its radio and TV programs have won numerous awards over the years, including Taiwan's prestigious Grammy equivalent, the Golden Bell and Golden Tripod Awards. During the 80s, uh, 70, 80s, the teaching English uh, by Doris has helped the eco uh, economy of Taiwan especially uh, for the, the, the rising of the economy. Doris was born in 1926 in Seattle, Washington. At 12 years old, she decided that she wanted to become a missionary. Ten years later, she boarded a ship bound for China in order to fulfill her dream. Doris then moved to Taiwan in 1951 after the Chinese Civil War. After she arrived, she noticed there were only a few churches on the East Coast. She therefore decided to set up her mission in Hualien County. It was here that she first met the indigenous Amis people. She also launched a Christian radio service and shortly after started an English teaching radio show. And the rest is history. The history of Studio Classroom, 60 years, we've been telling people how to speak English. I think uh, uh, we can call Doris, uh, you know, the uh, teacher of all Taiwanese people. So uh, uh, her influence is among all the generations. Uh, I, I, as far as I know, all the president uh, in Taiwan has gotten in touch with her and some of the general and the government and all the business area, uh, general managers, these kind of people, they learn English from her. In her 70 years teaching English in Taiwan, Doris has received numerous prestigious awards. These include the Order of the Brilliant Star, Taiwan's highest non-military honor given to her by then-President Chen Shui-bian in 2002 for her contributions to national development. Doris is now 96 years old, but she is still full of the same passion for teaching English as ever. In her own way, she has created a voice for Taiwan on the international stage, and she's continuing to innovate and think of fun ways for more people in Taiwan to learn and use English. Chris Ma and Ken Ning for Taiwan Talks. I wanted to ask a bit about your life story, how it's been fascinating, and how did you transition from coming to Taiwan, being a missionary, into taking English teaching f as your full-time mission to help Taiwan and the country? You could talk well, about the catalyst. When I, when I first came out and left my home, I went to China for one year and evacuated from the fighting three times, from the shooting at the airport. So I was only 21, first time I left home. But when we left home, we had to go for six years and we promised we will not go back. Oh, that's very hard when you're 21. But after one year in China, I went to Hong Kong 
And then I taught there, and the people on the fishing boats and in Hong Kong. But they said Hong Kong ocean dangerous. So people say, why? Some people went home, and they said, what about this country, Formosa? Oh, many Chinese. Okay, I don't know. So I came here, 1951. Came here, but I everybody went to Kaohsiung or Taichung. I said, what the east east coast? Nobody want to go there. If you land on the airplane, you have to shoot, shoot the buffalo away. Very, you know, primitive. But there were many mountain people there, and they had a school called the Taiwan uh, Seminary for Bible. And I taught there. I taught how to teach children. I taught in the grade schools. I went to the principal and I said, "Can we teach English in the school?" And he spoke Taiwanese. I was learning Mandarin, and ta ting bu dong. So he let me teach English in every school, for after school, and so I had 12 people working with me, and we went to every school. So but we taught them things they needed, but we also taught them that there is a God in heaven who loves them, and when they do things, don't be afraid because God is here to help you, and so you could put this together. You know, it's not separate, not just church here. No, your faith is more than just like going to church, no. And so I went to the tribes people. I had started Sunday school. I started 100 Sunday schools all over the East Coast, and you know, with my staff. And we did many things. So it, that's what it is. Mission work, it means helping people, and by helping them know what they need, but they also need to know that there's a God that helps them. So I've even told our president, I said, you know, never mind what people say about you. It's what God cares, and he'll help you. So I try to help everybody, even our president and vice president, because I love them too. And so I, that help became Yeah, the help school. everybody, mm -hmm. yeah. So it goes together. Yes. It's not just separate. Doris, if you could talk a bit about the challenges that you faced in missionary work as well as you know, your English language school and starting that here in Taiwan. Okay, well, you know, there's always challenges. Everybody has them, but sometimes they are financial. You don't have enough money to pay the TV station, and those are big challenges. Or maybe health-wise, or maybe you get sick, or maybe there's a typhoon and everything is destroyed. But I think having a positive attitude really helps because Ming Tian Hui go, believe in tomorrow, have faith. And I think faith helps you a lot because sometimes you can't do anything yourself. You say, God help me, and God helps you. But you have to ask him, you know. And I think the challenges are when these things happen in your life, when you don't have enough money, you have faith. I know one time we had to pay the TV station $1,000 and if we didn't pay, we'd go off. And, I, and our treasurer said, what are we gonna do? We have to pay by Monday, we have no money. But Sunday, a man came from Canada, a Chinese man, oh, you need, oh, I'll pay. And the, I said, here, you know, so you have to have faith. If you could talk a bit about the opportunity cost, as you mentioned, you know, your Boeing and all that. If I had five brothers and one of them is vice president of a Boeing co company and he offered me, Doris, you can come back to America, 2,000 a month. My salary was 100 a month. But it's kind of like God spoke to me and said, I didn't ask you there to make money. I asked you there to help the people. Never mind, I own the whole world. Never mind, okay, God, so I just stayed here. <laughs> and another brother was in charge of the Gu Wan Tuan in, in Vietnam, and he offered me a job and paid $1,000 a month. 100, okay, never mind. So we just don't do things for money. My challenges have been to keep positive. One time, the typhoon in Taipei and all of our stuff was destroyed. And what are we gonna do? Well, I said, we're still here. We're still alive. Never mind the stuff. And we just keep going, keep positive. Doris, you've been a household name to many Taiwanese. Um, as an educator and missionary for over half a century, um, You've associated your career with music. Can you talk about your experience on music and how you've helped people in remote areas in Taiwan to learn English through music? Well, I think we only learn things, as, as you say, we do it together, and we have to develop new ways because just the old way of just telling people something, they can't learn. 
you have to show them, you have to do things with them. And so I feel that developing more of a, what we call interaction, then we can really help. Because if you just talk, it doesn't do any good. But you have to interact with people. And I think that's what I've learned to do more and more different programs, not only studio classroom. We have Lucy Says for kids. We have many different things for different ages. You have to keep on inventing new things and keeping up with technology. Mm -hmm. Now, technology is very good, but technology is only a tool. And you have to use technology. So as new things develop, we have to learn those. So I had to learn all the new things, and I keep learning, because no matter how old we are, we have to keep learning. Mm -hmm. Does music play a part in that learning process? or? Yeah, and our teaching has to keep up. Our methods have to keep up. Yes. So we have to in help our teachers, encourage them. And sometimes people say, we need more foreigners here to teach. Not necessarily, because foreigners can only do so much. And there's so many schools. But if we can teach the teachers, the foreigners can help teach the teachers and help them, and then they can do the job, and it will be spread more all over the whole country. That will be the best way. Mm, it's interesting how you talk about the teaching method, because I remembered I can listen to your program, I can read the magazines, I can watch your program uh, in a video format. Um, what is the most effective way in teaching English nowadays, in your opinion? So why do we do this way? Huh? What, what is the most effective way well, nowadays? Well, I think that's uh, one thing is that you have to listen. So of course, if you listen to English, and you have to know what to listen to. If you just go to the movies, I don't know, sometimes you know about that vocabulary, you know. Mm -hmm. But if we can teach things that are useful that people need, I think that's the best way. You have to listen. But I tell people you have to use it. If, I, if you just listen and you didn't use it, you wouldn't be able to speak it. You have to use it or lose it. So I teach them to use it or lose it. And I think that's very important. So we hope to encourage you, and not just you to listen, but your family and your mom and your kids and everybody. Sometimes whole families watch together, and then they can use it. You talked about using it. In what, what ways do you encourage people to use it in, say, in daily life? Or do you have yeah. any examples? And, you know, in, in the family, sometimes the fathers are very busy and they don't have time. To, but I think if they can use English and play a game, don't just say to kids, no, you have to learn English. No. Oh, you have to say, let's play this game. Mm. Give me a red three. Give me a, you know, and they want to win. And so you, oh, they have to learn English to beat Papa, you know? <laughs> and that way, it's a close family member. Yeah. In my family, there were eight kids, so many. But my mom always played games with us. And even when the kids were big and professional, they came home, Mom, let's play a game. So if you play games in English with your kids, mm -hmm. then they can learn more. Do interactive things. And I think that that's very important in Taiwan for to, to spread to society, not just school, mm -hmm. homes. Homes. The marketplace might say, what do you want to buy today? How much, you know, and help, oh, oh, you speak English. And it gives people kind of uplift. So that's why we try to encourage people to use it or lose it. I see. Uh, did you get a sense that when it comes to speaking English, uh, going up stage and sharing or doing and acting, Taiwanese children are especially shy in using the language and expressing themselves. If you do feel this way, what is your magic to help Taiwan children to overcome that? Well, I think one thing we have to overcome, the first thing is to get rid of fear. Now, whatever you do, I have taught people many things. I've taught people to how to swim. Older people, they've never been swimming. I said, there, put some water on your face, you know, and teach them to get rid of the fear. Oh, and this is what, what you, what allows to do shui qian sui. I teach them scuba diving and everything. And because don't be afraid. And then, oh, it's so beautiful. But if you're doing, and so you have to get rid of fear. And the second thing is, don't be a perfectionist. Don't say, my, my English is not good. I can't speak. It's not good. Never mind. You have to not try to be perfect, but just use it the way you can. And gradually, it will become better because you hear people, oh, it's better. And so I think 
the method is very important. Don't you think you have to use it? When you listen to our program, did you use it? Yeah, I repeat with it and uh, repeat multiple times after listening to good. it. So that's why your English is good. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of using it, do you feel that it's different, say, in countries close confidence. to Taiwan, like say, you know, in China or you mentioned Japan earlier? Do you feel how Taiwanese people learn English is different from that of our neighbors here? Actually, to me, people, I don't care if they're Taiwanese or Japanese or what, everybody, people are people. And and well, me and Fonsula, you know, you're this kind. This is, no, everybody has a need wherever you go. And so if you can relate to the people and let them know you care about them, you're not just trying to make money and sell this book and so You let people know, I want to help you. And this makes a big difference. And you don't care what kind of people they are. When I was a student, I read your magazines, and in my whole class read your magazines. I'm so curious, how do you curate the content and believe that is suitable and going to be helpful for telling a student? That's a very important question because we have some English teachers, quite a few, but 12 right now, but some of them are new. They don't know the culture too well because they haven't been here too long. So when we look at the contents, my job is to look at that and they say, let's do this. And I said, no, about 80% I said, no, because they don't know the culture. So we have to know what people need. That's very important. So my job is to oversee that the things that we teach are important and try to help get the right material. And then the teachers do it and they teach other people to do it. But we get the content from different places so you get a variety. Now, sometimes people want us to teach exactly what they teach in the school. But other teachers say, no, we already have that. We try to give them things they don't get in the school so that they get modern English and they can use it wherever they go. So our content, we're very conscious of making it different. So that's why at first we just taught studio classroom. Then they said, make an easier one. Okay, let's go, let's talk, advance. Now we have three magazines and then we have kids training. When the kids come here to learn video from six to 12, and they use English and they make their own video. So we teach the kids. We have Lucy says for little tiny kids that are not even in school. So we keep saying, where is the need? And then what can we teach them? Let's teach them important. Now, sometimes in school, they teach a lot of things you don't need. I try to teach things that you need that are important in your life, things that you can use. And so that's my kind of job to oversee that to help the new English teachers, and then they help you. Well, uh, on a side note, uh, Taiwan has an ambition goal to becoming a bilingual country um, by the year 2030. But as far as we know, you have already mentioned this concept or the need. When it's 60, that's so many years ago. I, I wonder why do you feel that way? Well, you know, if they want to have this goal, which is good because Singapore and all those countries, they do that. One thing we have to do is to increase the time at school because now the schools just have a short English class. It's not very long and the teacher teaches, but we need to have more time, more English classes. And also some schools even have a TV set and they have today's phrase and they're on the hall of kids and they use English to teach music. They use English to teach math and we have to encourage that. But one way we have to help the teachers don't expect foreigners to come and do that because foreigners take a long time to adjust. They don't know what you need. You have to live here with the people to know what they need. So I think instead of getting a lot more English teachers, we need English teachers who can help the Chinese teachers and then more people can learn. That's the way we can reach the goal. But also the families have to let the kids know it's important. Sometimes I ask kids that, and do we, then we don't need English, you know, but you have to make them feel like, oh yeah, we, English is fun. Use it to play, use it. Don't make them feel that you have to learn this. That's too hard. Mm -hmm. We have to make English more a part of their living, of their speaking. Can you talk a bit about making it fun? How do you make English learning fun? Like what? Well, one way you can make it fun is to play some games, but also when you're in school teaching, you can divide in groups and do little Duanju skits. And instead of saying, okay, Robert, get up and give us, no, you get a group of people up 
and they work together and they show their skin this one this one and then you can say which one of those is better not which person mm -hmm. so they get up and they do something together okay uh, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to tell a story and tell I got on the bus uh, and let people get on the bus you know and interact and then they can learn they can't learn if they just bus bus but no yeah. you have to interact at the school they need to do that more. They don't do that enough. And they have no time. They need to teach a little bit and act a little bit, both. Mm. So the key is interaction, Doris. And um, speaking of becoming a bilingual nation by 2030, as Catherine mentioned, yeah. what, what do you believe are Taiwan's largest challenges or impediments to getting there? Do you feel what do we need to do in terms what of? What do we need to get there? Well, I think they need to keep in letting people know that it's important because if it's not important, you don't want to do it. You see, but also you have to help them to like it a little bit because you have to do everything. You have to, you have, oh, but to try to make it a little bit more useful. So if you use your English, we have taught English to some offices like Acer and some of them, and we encourage the people in the offices to get together and have a little English time and not just the school. And you have to make it more. Oh, and then, oh, you speak English. Even your grandma and them, and or in the mountain villages, wow, you speak English. You have to make it kind of something to be honor and proud, and not just so I have to learn it. Mm -hmm. Make it fun. Would you believe that it's a culture difference thing that sometimes, well, we went to our cram schools, we take so many exams in learning English. Do you think the, maybe the, the teaching method should be, you know, fundamentally improved uh, when, when we're talking about becoming a bilingual country uh, yes. by 2030? Well, I think being bilingual is a little important today because we're not just only here in Taiwan. You know, we are a window of the world. And in Taiwan, sometimes everybody thinks, oh, we're such a small country and China's so big. And all. But you know, small is not bad. Like a diamond is small and you can shine. And Taiwan can shine like a diamond throughout Asia. When you look at the other countries, Taiwan has made more progress than a lot of them. I don't want to mention their name, but, but actually Taiwan has been like a diamond to shine. And I think the most important thing when people come here is not how beautiful it is, because many countries are beautiful, oh, every country, but the people. And if the people are beautiful, if the people are friendly, if the people, this is what makes Taiwan very special to shine like a diamond throughout the country. And Taiwan has done this, and we need to keep doing this. And people on paper, they look forward to us, but it's the people that make a difference, not the language. Speaking of people, which areas do you feel touch you the most in terms of people here? Is it the kindness or do you feel it's um, the will to Hospitality learn? Hospitality or, or? Or to, in terms of progress and all, as you well, mentioned. You know, Taiwanese people are willing to make changes. Now, some countries, they, they don't care, but Taiwan, young people, they, they want to change and they go overseas and they learn and they come back. And I think Taiwan's good thing is that we are willing to make changes, we're willing to grow, but we need to show them how, and give them the tools. So since they're willing, let's work together and make it bilingual so we can let the whole world know and we can go any place in the world where we can understand the world. If we don't understand the world, we can't sell things to them, you know? We have to know. So in order to do that, you need to speak English. If you go to some conference someplace, everybody's speaking English, um, um, uh, you, have, you know, you have to be able to interact with everybody all over the world in order to make an in-shop to it. Uh, I want to circle back a little bit, if I may. You keep emphasizing we don't have to attract so many foreigners to come to Taiwan to deliver the English education. Right. Um, we have to educate the teachers, however, right. local teachers, you mean. Um, you think it's a more effective yeah, way? Yeah, we need to help them more. And so the younger teachers, sometimes they're willing but sometimes they don't get the opportunity. But we need to have some, uh, you know, meetings with them and, and counsel with them. And, have, and we have done this in Dajiru, where we live. And uh, we've had, uh, going to the, the Shaoshu, which is a little school. And the English teachers also, we teach them. 
And then when we walk on the street, the little kids will say, how are you today? In English. Now, that doesn't happen other places. Because we taught the teachers, and the teachers, we help the teachers and encourage them so they don't feel they can't speak. But we give them the tools. We can teach. We use TV, we use it, and they can look at that. But the teachers also will use it. The mm -hmm. teachers don't have to be afraid their English is not good. Use it. Doesn't have to be perfect to teach English still. Yeah. Um, since you've been here for 70 years, we're so curious. When you look back, how would you summarize your accomplishments or your experience? Because you are one of the most experienced teachers we have here for so many years. Um, that's your legacy, I would say. Uh, is there anything that you still hope to achieve? Well, actually, I feel that one thing we need to learn here and in China and every place, I often go there and give seminars too and so forth, but we have to teach with love. And I think love is the most important thing because if we teach just for business, if we teach just, it's no good. But when you teach people because you want to help them and you love them, and I think that's one thing that we have to keep telling our teachers, don't hit the kids, but just teach them in love, see? And I think love is the most important thing in anybody's life. And without love, we can't do anything. So since I really love the people here, they know that, and the kids, and they know that. And then, oh, they come and speak to you, see? So teach in love. What does that translate to in terms of speaking with love, um, teaching with love? Teaching with love is very important, yeah. How, how, how do you describe that? Is it, you know, you use your heart to teach, or is there anything specific in terms of you have to teach by encouraging them and letting them uh, do more interaction. You know, I have a little chart that's very important. I want everybody to know that yeah. because if you just talk, they only remember 20%. But if you talk and interact, they can learn 90%. If they do the action, they will remember. And so we have to not only teach, but we have to review and we have to do it in front and wow, that was good, and do it that way, instead of just saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. That, you have to love your students, and, and you have to care about them. And some of them need more help. You help them. You put them with other students and have them help them. Don't say, oh, mm, that's very important. Do you feel that Taiwan saw a lot of progress, you know, since you're 70 years here and teaching them? Do you feel the level has actually increased? We still have to keep up. I have to keep up. I teach advanced and look at the article. Wow, I didn't know that. I have to keep up and we have to keep learning, you know, be life learners. Even though you've learned, you have to be life learners. So you need to keep on and you need to listen more and do more. And remember, use English every day. We have a little slogan, English every day. Let's talk in English every 10 minutes every day. Everybody in the whole country. Wow. That would be pretty much goal, but it's possible. And you've been here for over 70 years. Is there anything that keeps you here? Or would you ever want to move back to the United States? Or yeah, to go back, yeah. Would, or do you feel this is home and yeah. you? Actually, uh, we have a singing group called Heavenly Melody because we've been on Heavenly Melody TV for many years. And I go around with them sometimes. We've been to 30 countries. And so we don't just stay in Taiwan. And we, when we go to another country, Sweden, Norway, Germany, we learn some songs in their language, but we also tell them about, we, te we teach about God and the Bible, but we teach about Taiwan culture. And then they say, oh, I didn't know Taiwan was like that. So every country we go to, the people get a different impression of Taiwan because we're there. So I don't just sit in Taiwan. I go, we helped Kazakhstan start TV, and now all through that. And we taught in Iran and Iraq and those countries. And they, they call me Mama Doris. <laughs> and then I say to them, God bless you. And they say, Isha Allah. <laughs> and so, you know, you can, we can re impress the whole world, not just Taiwan. But Taiwan people are very important in the world. So each one of you have to, and keep on learning, and don't be afraid to keep on learning more every day. Well, it's really impressive in the number of countries that you've been to. Can you talk about what resonates most with them about Taiwan, with 
the Sweden and all these countries. Well, we tell them, you know, in Taiwan too, that people, we love our families here and, and uh, actually uh, we have gone from an agriculture society to a technology. Now people, we have things that other people don't have. And so they think, wow, how did you get that? So we try to help other countries too. When you learn something, you want to share. We don't just share it with ourselves. We share it with the world. Mm. By going to other countries, we can share it with the world. And then when they come here, it's very important. Mm. And I think that we are doing that right now, but we have to keep on. And we don't have to say, some people say, well, I'll toy show. When I was 65, everybody said, are you going to toy show? And I asked this one man, very important, Billy Graham Moosh, and I said, do you think I should toy show? He said, Doris, it's not in the Bible. And so uh, I kept on going. Even people said, oh, well, you're still teaching? Yeah, I'm still teaching. I'm still teaching now every day. And, you know, you have to keep on. That's very important for everybody. Yeah. And you guys have to keep on and yeah. keep learning. Yeah. And we can help the whole world, don't you think? Yes. Well, before we wrapped up, uh, we wanted to ask uh, if there's anything or any tips that you are willing to share from your personal experiences with English language instructors here. Um, how, how, how can they perform better? How, what, what is your tips or advice for them? What is my one? What is your advice? My advice is that we don't stop. We're going to keep on. Don't say toy means backwards. A woman yell wang chin so up say toy. So keep going forward and learning new things and keep on using your English. And I think the best thing we can do is to encourage each other, to help each other, and work together because teamwork is very important. One person cannot do anything. I didn't do anything by myself. Many people. And so to keep on as a good team. Here's a good team. See? And we can work together and we can do more things and have a goal. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Keep on. So would that goal be bilingualism by 2030? Bilingual is a possibility. If we believe in it, then let's work towards the goal together. Not just one person, all of us. But Doris, practically speaking, do you believe that the, the number of hours of English teaching needs to increase to get there, like say in Singapore, the curriculum's mostly in English. Do you feel yeah. that that needs to happen here too? Or? Well, I think being, you know, being positive is very important. Sometimes we look at the way things are and they're not so good, but we, we want to look at the way things can be if we are. And so I think for us here, the main thing for us to do is to encourage each other, to help each other in every way we can, so if I can help you anymore, I will. If you can help each other, that's good. So let's not be afraid, let's keep on. We now hear from Ralph Rogers, the Taiwan director of the British Council. Ralph shares with me how Taiwan can leverage its advantages in becoming a bilingual country. Let's take a look. Ralph, what will it take for Taiwan to become a bilingual nation by 2030? Taiwan is already bilingual now. In fact, it's multilingual. You know, there are many languages spoken across Taiwan, Mandarin, Holo, Hakka, all of the Aboriginal languages. Um, and, and actually that multilingualism is a fantastic thing when it comes to learning English, because the research has shown that children who speak more than one language have a much better understanding of how languages work. And that really supports the learning of other languages, like English, for example. Taiwan uh, you know, has a, a fantastic education system. Now, we know that from uh, you know, the results of international uh, comparator um, exams like PISA and TIMS, which assess kind of educational achievement. And we know from that that you know, Taiwan has a fantastic education system. And actually, from, we know from research that the British Council has done for the Ministry of Education, that 20% of uh, students graduate from senior high school with um, upper intermediate or advanced levels of English. So, you know, Taiwan has a fantastic foundation on which to build, um, but it depends what you mean by bilingual, okay? So if, you, if you're talking about developing a bilingual education system where children uh, are being taught in both Chinese and English, then I think that's going to take the work of a generation. But certainly by 2030, I think Taiwan will be able to have everything in place that it needs, all of the systems in place that it needs to ensure the long-term success and sustainability 
of the bilingual policy. Can you talk a bit about the issues Taiwan will need to overcome to be, actually become a bilingual nation? Well, I mentioned that baseline study that the British Council did where we assessed the English proficiency of school students across the whole of Taiwan. And that told us that you know, high school students, at more than 20% of high school students are already graduating with upper intermediate or advanced levels of English. But it also told us that the weakest of the four skills of reading, writing, speaking, and listening, the weakest of those four skills was spoken English. So clearly, spoken English, developing students' proficiency in spoken English is going to be the number one challenge that Taiwan has to, to address. And um, you know, an education system is made up of, any education system, any English education system is made up of three components. Yeah, the curriculum, which is you know, what you teach, what is taught, the delivery of that curriculum, how that curriculum is taught, and then the assessment of that curriculum, how you measure students' progress as they move through that curriculum. So, you know, Taiwan's uh, English curriculum you know, already contains the four skills, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So I think the biggest return on investment that Taiwan will get is by investing in the teachers who are delivering that curriculum, making sure that they have got uh, the time and the resources, that they're given the time and resources for their continuing professional development to make sure that they've got, um, that they're able to adopt 21st century communicative approaches to teaching English that will really develop students' spoken English abilities. How can Taiwan become a bilingual nation such as Singapore or, as you see, to a lesser extent, Hong Kong? And how can the British government work with the Taiwanese government or local agencies here, including how you're working with the Ministry of Education and the great work that the British Council does? Well, I love you know, Taiwan's ambition to kind of cultivate English proficiency of you know, more and more people in Taiwan. And you know, English doesn't belong to the United Kingdom. It doesn't belong to America. It doesn't belong to Australia or anywhere else. It's a, an international lingua franca that is used by billions of people to communicate with one another. You know, so Taiwan, Taiwanese people aren't necessarily going to be using English to communicate with you know, Brits like me. They'll be using English as a lingua franca to communicate with billions of English speakers all over the world, which is a great thing. You know, that's a fantastic thing. And you know, we're very supportive of that. Uh, and you know, the UK has a wealth of experience and expertise, not just in the teaching of English as a language, but also in the use of English uh, to teach other subjects. And the British Council have been working in partnership with many UK education institutions uh, to support the Ministry of Education in developing their strategy and to, in, in making evidence-based policy decisions. And so in recent years, I, I mentioned the baseline study, so we, we assessed the English proficiency of students across Taiwan. But what we're really focusing on right now is working both with the Ministry of Education and with local education institutions to develop local capabilities and local capacity so that Taiwan has everything it needs to, to ensure the bilingual policy is successful without relying too heavily on having to import talent from overseas. Because you know, cultivating English proficiency in Taiwan is in everyone's best interest, enabling more and more people in, in Taiwan to, to speak English more fluently, to be able to communicate with those billions of speakers, English speakers all over the world, that is going to develop more and more opportunities for peace and prosperity for everyone. Ralph, you talked about the need for Taiwan to increase its speaking opportunities and so that students can practice more and converse. Can you talk about how that can be specifically done? I mean, you know, the, the National Development Council, the Ministry of Education are already doing lots of things, creating lots of resources, online resources, digital resources, using digital technology more effectively to create opportunities for students and, and, and citizens to use English in, in meaningful ways. I mean, in the classroom, I mentioned you can make it more communicative, so less teacher directed, less, you know, the, the teacher kind of imparting their knowledge and creating more opportunities for students to engage in conversation with each other in the classroom and to engage in conversation with the teacher, of course, uh, and then making, creating opportunities, more and more opportunities outside of the classroom, creating opportunities for international connection. The students in Taiwan have opportunities to engage with students, not just in the UK, but all over the world where they can use 
English as a, as, a, as a lingua franca and where they can really see the benefits to them in, in, in developing English. Um, you know, we did some research with the Ministry of Education and obviously the number one a motivating factor for students learning English at universities in Taiwan is obviously to, to open up career opportunities for themselves. But the number two motivating factor is for students to be able to engage in English language cultural content, films and music um, and other English language cultural content. So, you know, launching channels like Taiwan Plus and, and, and creating fantastic high quality English language content that people in Taiwan can access is a fantastic thing to do. Doris, what do you think is different from Taiwan and China in terms of, you mentioned you went to China many times and with your famous speech in Harbin, do you feel English language or how they perceive you know, the international community is different in China? I think it's very good to keep an international relationship. A couple of years ago, I went to Shanghai with all of the Montessori, with the kids and 400 teachers from all over China. And then um, I went to many places to judge contests and do things like that. But I think our relationships, we have to keep up a good relationship, you know, and we don't have to be afraid that we just have to say, you know, be friends and help each other and do that. That's much better. And we don't need to, to think of all the politics. I don't think about politics. You know, when I was in Shanghai, uh, they give a speech. I was the main speaker at this big Montessori conference. Very scary. But anyway, a Chinese official came in, sat right by me, a big top official, communist, you know. And he said, you're the same age as my mother. And I said, oh, how is she, you know? And he said, she's not living. I said, okay, never mind, I'll be your mother. And then he got up to start the conference and he said, Pumu, we said she would be my mama and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I don't care who they are, they're people. We don't look at their politics, we just, they're people. And we're people. And wherever we go, in Russia, there's people. We don't care, the government is one thing. Forget the government, people are people. Mm -hmm. So I look at people, I don't look at their politics. Thank you so, more, so much for talking with us. We've talked about the teaching method here, uh, your experience, intensive experience here in Taiwan for more than 17 years. Um, you established the whole educational system here in Taiwan. Many, many kids benefit from your education and also being uh, to have fun, being interactive, use English every day, and let's talk in English. <laughs> Moving into 2030. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching Town Talks. I'm Catherine Liu. I'm Rath Wang. I'll stay safe. I'll see you next time.